Welcome to Frankie Sense and More. We're almost at the end of October. Can you believe it? And this morning, my granddaughter took her first three steps. How exciting is that? <laughs> she turned one on the 24th. So I'm really, really excited for her because I know once she starts doing something, boom, she does it better and better all the time. Just like we do. Practice makes perfect. And Brent is, you know, he's been practicing doing movie reviews for a really long time. So I'm sure that this is going to be another perfect review. I know if you've been sitting home like I have, completely bored out of your tree. Uh, hearing these, you know, reviews of movies and documentaries that you can watch that, that we have watched for you uh, could mean everything. They don't, you know, they do cost a little bit of money. So not as much money as going to the movie theater, but still, it, you know, it's a little bit of a penny so out of your pocket. So um, if we can help you there, that's great. Um, we have some really, really great movies for you today. And I'm really excited for Brent to get started. Let's, let's go forward. Hey, Frankie. Thanks for having me back on. Yeah. So our first movie today is one of the first films that's beginning to get a lot of award season buzz, and that's The Trial of the Chicago Seven. It's a Netflix production. Uh, it's, been, it's been in and out of theaters. So, I mean, you can still see it in a theatrical setting if you want, but if not, you can always stream it. But For free on Netflix. <laughs> like, blow me away. <laughs> <laughs> but this is, a, um, this is a recreation of the famous trial that took place after the Chicago riots at the 1968 Democratic National Convention. And it's really well done. It's, it's well acted, it's well written, uh, gets you into a lot of detail that went on uh, before the trial took place and then during the trial itself. And I mean, some of it is just, it's like a circus. The, you know, think some of the things that went on in the courtroom. Um, it's kind but of it's, funny, actually. It, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Abby Hoffman was pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's it's really it's a, it's a great movie. It um, is a good movie. It's written by Aaron Sorkin, who did The West Wing, and he did a few movies like um, uh, he wrote the screenplay, I believe, to The Social Network, and also to Molly's Game. And he's assembled a phenomenal cast. I mean, just phenomenal cast with Sasha Baron Cohen and Eddie Redmayne. Mark Rylance, Michael Keaton, Frank Langell. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. And they're all terrific. So oh, this I should, is, sorry. I'm going to share our screen. I got the movie poster for you guys. I'm sorry. I'm like, oh, what am I doing? <laughs> Let me share this picture with you. Yeah, um, here we go. The Chicago this, is, this is one really worth seeing just for the overall quality of the film. And also the, the fact that the message is extremely timely. I mean, um, yeah. You know, in this, uh, in the case of the trial, there was a very concerted effort made to uh, squelch the freedoms of fair of uh, fair trial and free speech, and you know, <laughs> those things are in peril again. And this movie reminds us of that in a very, very pointed and direct way, saying, "Hey, you know, you could lose these rights very easily if you're not careful." So um, this is something that I think that is, is worth seeing not only for the entertainment value, but also for the message that it sends. And as I mentioned, um, this is one film that is beginning to get a fair amount of award season buzz. It's one of the, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the first films to do that because I mean, there really haven't been that many award season films released yet anyways, but uh, this one's kind of leading the pack at this point. So go see it, whether you see it in the theater, whether you see it on Netflix, it's, it's really worth it. You see Jane Fonda as one of her first husbands. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you see the activist. The activist in her yeah. has been alive a long time. <laughs> and, and it shows. It shows for sure. Okay. Yeah, I loved it. I absolutely was riveted. I thought it was amazing. Just a really, really well done movie. There are some things where the, the, um, the director does take a little bit of liberty with the facts. Um, I'm not going to say where, where we, <laughs> you know, where we in the film. But where he does, I mean, it, it makes for damn good theater. I mean, if yeah. nothing else, you know, so, but a good, a good portion of it is rooted in truth. And apparently in the actual trial itself, there were a lot more crazy wild things that went on that they didn't even include because it was just such an outrageous circus, as I mentioned before. So the, um, the judge was out, outrageous and I mean, really was <laughs> crazy man. And like, um, Frank Langella has long time been a favorite of mine. Like he was amazing um, in oh, what was it? the the president. Um, oh, Frost Nixon. 
Yeah. No, no, not Frost Nixon. The other one, it, it was it, um, Johnson, Lyndon Johnson. Oh. He, went, he was in Lyndon B. Johnson's movie. And, you know, he, he's just such a phenomenal character. But watch it to the end and find out what happens to that judge. <laughs> it's, it's, it's worth it. I mean, talk about it. It's worth it. What can I say? Yeah. Um, but definitely Netflix. What are you doing tonight? Go watch it. There you go. Which was our next one? Uh, our next one is an Israeli film oh, yeah. uh, called God of the Piano. And this one just sort of snuck up underneath the radar. Uh, and it's a terrific psychological thriller about a woman who's a, a, a famous, uh, not a famous, he's a very talented pianist, but she's never quite risen to the level of expertise that's present in the other members of her family who are all virtuosos. Mm -hmm. So she hopes to make up for that by when she becomes pregnant to give birth to a virtuoso that she can raise herself. There's just one problem. When the child is born, the child is deaf. And suddenly her dreams are shattered in terms of how am I going to live out my, my dream here? Uh, well, she ends up doing something that is not exactly kosher. Not kosher. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one day while she's in the hospital nursery, she switches the hospital bracelets of her child with another child who is a hearing child and doesn't tell anybody and takes him home and raises him as her own. And he does become quite talented, but she also he starts does. running into some problems. For example, um, when he gets to be in his teenage years, he starts to be kind of independent. And, and probably the personality of, of his parents is coming yeah. out through him now yeah she's yeah. like she's like the real kind of prototypical stage mother very controlling doesn't let him uh, engage in a lot of the things that other kids do so he's missing out because she's afraid that they're going to become distractions exactly um and you know it all of a sudden even though she had this plan that she thought was foolproof for being able to still raise her virtuoso starts falling apart on her and it gets to a point where she has to keep making one more fabrication after one more fabrication after one more fabrication to keep it under wraps and to try and keep the dream alive. And really, she's just trying to please her father. Of all of those, just trying yeah. to please her dad. And it's an Israeli film. It's, it's in Hebrew. There are subtitles. The music is fabulous. And um, it's an amazing film. I loved it. It I really, really is. It. You know, this is a this is a debut feature from the director. And I, I when I saw this, I said, "Hey, if if he can do this now, yeah. I can't wait to see what he comes up with next." His name is Ite Tal, and um, it's a a very it's also a very economic economically written film. It's only eighty minutes long, but he packs so much into those eighty minutes. And it's amazing in the way that he does a lot of things by way of showing rather than telling. Yes. And that's a real, that's a hard one for a lot of filmmakers to get. Uh, but he does it so skillfully. So yes, I, I recommend this one highly. It's a, Me too. Yeah, it'll keep you, it will keep you kind of on the edge of your seat pretty much all the way throughout. And that's kind of hard to do these days too. <laughs> if you're trying to, to stream, I found for me the easiest is this first go to Apple, Apple TV and put in the name of the film and pretty much all of the films I want to watch, I can get through Apple um, library or prime. If you're on Amazon, one of the two of them will, will pretty much has all of them. So, you know, try that first. If you're having problems, I think maybe this one I screened from a, a movie theater somewhere. I can't remember, but um, that is one of the easier ways. I well, being in Canada, if you're in Canada, that's one of the easier ways to, to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the U.S., quite a few uh, independent distributors have partnered with film centers and independent theaters. Yeah, where they end up um, splitting the proceeds, and it's helping some of these um, precariously positioned organizations, you know, stay alive. Which yeah, I think I got it from a, a movie theater in Ohio, this particular one, yeah. know, something like that. But So it's, you know, it's, it's a good deal for, for both organizations yeah. that way. And you know what, for like, if it's $15 or $10 to rent or whatever it is, it's, it's 
a really good evening of entertainment. So this is, you know, these are good movies, really, yeah. really good movies that we're talking about. This one is also going to be featured at the, um, the St. Louis Film Festival coming up in a couple of weeks. So anybody who's uh, in the St. Louis area or actually the St. Louis Film Festival is going to be streaming virtually this year. So many of the films yeah. are going to be available all across the country. Um, you can get it from there as well. That's very cool. All right. Where are we going? Okay, our next film, <clears throat> excuse me, is a very moving film called Blackbird. This is my favorite film. Yeah, this, was, oh, this one really, it tugs at your heartstrings so much. Uh, it's a story about a, an ALS patient played by Susan Sarandon, who is, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> whose condition has been deteriorating rapidly. And she knows that she's only a few weeks away from being bedridden and hooked up to a number of machines. And that's not what she wants, given the fact that she's always been very independent and a free spirit. So she decides that with the assistance of her husband, who's a physician played by Sam Neill, Love him. Um, that she is going to bring her life to a conclusion. But before she does that, uh, what she plans to do is have her whole family together for one final holiday celebration. And it's an opportunity for them to say goodbyes, uh, wrap up unfinished business. But it's also a time when a lot of new business that's never been raised before suddenly rears its ugly head. And the whole situation ends up being not quite what she hoped for, but it really ends up also being a time when it can be purging and curative at the same time, which is a very unusual combination. Um, the film um, has got a tremendous supporting cast in it with Kate Winslet and Mia Wasikowska and Lindsay Rain Duncan. Wilson. Yeah, and, and Rain Wilson in a dramatic role. That's something yeah. I have, yeah, a very rare opportunity there. Yeah. Um, the, um, one of the things I think has been a little unfortunate with this film is that some critics have been kind of unfair to it in terms of saying that, well, it's just another typical dying protagonist movie. And I really kind of disagree with that and the fact that this is specifically dealing more directly with the question of the right to die. Yeah, the and choice. There, haven't, you know? there uh, haven't been that many movies that have actually tackled that on point, and, and especially that have not tackled them on point as well as this one does. I agree. I agree. You know? ALS is a horrific disease. And, you know, here's a woman who chose to go out before it could totally cripple her. Nobody wants to be able not to be able to breathe. I mean, that has to be the worst sensation in the world and to choose. But, the, you know, I absolutely love, love, love this film. Susan Sarandon, you know, 70 years old, looks gorgeous. Um, and, and, and you can totally believe it at the same time. Sam Neill is her husband. Like, you could feel the love between them. And the dog, like Kate Winslet, very different Kate Winslet in this movie. Yes. Um, very, very different. And Mia too, really, you know, for her, to, that role that she played. Um, I love this movie so much. I can't even tell you guys how, how, how you should go and see it. But what got me at the very end when, when you know, she, she did what she did and she said, where am I going? Yeah. <laughs> like, it was like, he goes, I don't know. You'll tell me. It's like so real. It was so real. Like you felt that. Yeah. You know, you could put yourself there. there. There were there were a few things in the film that I would have done a little differently, but on balance, I would say that pretty much this gets it right across the board. Um, and as you say, for Susan Sarandon, I mean, she is just phenomenal in this. And it's, it's amazing. She's really been doing some of her best work in yes. her career in recent years. And it's been in movies that unfortunately have not been getting a whole lot of attention. I mean, she was terrific in this. She was terrific in a film, uh, I believe it was two years ago, called The Viper Club. Um, she did some great work in a movie about a decade ago called uh, The Company You Keep. Um, and the one where she was Rose Byrne's mother. That was a really good one. Yeah. I, I, mean, I mean, this is really all a really great body of work. And it's unfortunate that it's not getting the attention that it deserves. And she's been doing so, this forever. Starting Rocky yeah. Horror, right? I mean, <laughs> she's had a very long career. She's awesome. So I, I, I'm, really, I'm really very high on this movie in terms of telling people go see it because it's just it's so good you'll cry so take your kleenex yeah but, it's beautiful. <laughs> but and, you'll and, laugh you'll yeah. laugh too yeah you will not, i mean she's got a real snappy sense of humor in this film 
in terms of some of the things that she says, particularly to Kate Winslet. Yeah. And, you know, to, her gran and to her grandson. <laughs> and it wasn't the kind of, you're going to sappy crying, we're going to make you cry. It wasn't that at all. No. It was just the emotion felt so real that you, that you were caught in it and, and want just cry because you felt like you were part of the it's, family. It's like, very organic emotion that comes out of yeah, this. Yeah. 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 There's nothing, you know, meticulous about it as far as like, we're going to manage your feelings and, you know, no. Oh, exactly. And I think that's one of the things where a lot of the critics have kind of gotten it wrong because they've been comparing it to things like terms of endearment and yeah. so forth, which, which are very manipulative. And, you exactly. know, that was a word I was searching and, for. Yeah. You know, it, it's like, if you can't figure out a way to get yourself out of the story, well, kill off one of the characters and that's going to be a good way to get your sympathies. Right. This movie doesn't do it. This one says right from the beginning, she is suffering from this illness and she is deciding to take matters into her own hands, exercise her power of free will and choice to say, this is how I'm going to go out. And you can like it or love it, but it's none of your damn business because it's my life. And, you know, she's there with her very best friend from college. Yes. Who's always been in her life and her husband, who's a doctor. Um, and, and yeah, they have a beautiful, it's funny, like the home looks Scandinavian in, in its austerity kind of with the yeah. art, but then it's like got this kind of architecture that looks a little Scandinavian on the inside. Well, it's it's <laughs> funny you should mention that because actually this is a remake of a Danish film. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah, okay. Called, called The Silent Heart, which was made back uh, about, I believe, eight or nine years ago. Okay. So, um, you know. Uh, but, you Sorry, I, I'm having my roof redone right now. <laughs> you saw me jump there. But I think it I think it translates, you know, really well to oh, an, American, yeah. an American audience. So they got the cast right, and and you know, Kate Winslet's teenage son, when he came, he goes like, "When's it happening?" Like, you know, he's all kind of excited but nervous at the same time. That's exactly what a teenager would be like, you know, <laughs> like the things come out of their mouths and they don't even think about it. Like, oh, she's gonna kill herself. Okay, cool. Like, when's that? When's that gonna take place? How are they doing it? You know, it was well, very. And cool. also, yeah, and the other thing too is, is he's. Um, He's very cognizant of exactly what's going on in terms of uh, there's one scene where they're they're setting up a Christmas tree and yeah. he says there was something to the effect of so is there any infinite wisdom that you want to share? You know, <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I love that. That was so good. Old people always want to tell you how to live your life. <laughs> <laughs> that was brilliant. That was really good. I like that a lot. Yeah. All right. So next we have uh, our documentary pick for the month, and that's a film called House of Cardin, which is a sure profile was. of Pierre Cardin, the legendary designer, um, who has made a name for himself in countless ways over the years. And it explores um, all the very interesting innovations that he did, not only in fashion, but also in marketing, in terms of helping to uh, take the designer name and make it kind of a household thing that it hadn't been previously. Um, and it, it shows how um, design is not something that is only limited for the wealthy, can be something that... Yeah, he took it out of the good. out of haute couture into, into mainstream. Exactly. He wanted every woman to wear these clothes, but not just not just fashion and marketing, but also he was he was a creator, he was an inventor, and so he created lamps and and you know architecture was very important to him and you could see that in his clothes and so you know all, all of his designs come from you know this architectural background almost it seems like and he was like 800 i think he's developed 800 products something like that something like that i mean that's amazing you know it's it's and it's it's been not limited just to fashion it's gone into yeah uh, cosmetics and, and uh, uh, perfumes and consumer goods. I mean, he even, you know, designed a, a car for AMC back in the early 70s. I mean, like, it, it, is there anybody who doesn't know his name? Yeah. Nobody. And it's amazing that the fact that um, he's 98 years old, he's still going strong. Yeah. Um, and even though you're very familiar with the name on the product, you're not very familiar with the man because he's a very private person. This is one of the first times that he's opened up to allow this kind of uh, examination of his life previously. It was interesting. He's actually Italian, not French. Yes, exactly. So he came from Italy and, you know, it was, he was very handsome and he said, he goes, well, you know, I was very good looking. So everybody wanted to sleep with me. Yeah. 
<laughs> he was very candid about that, which is, it was kind of a funny line. It was funny. And it, it gets into his personal life a little bit, but not That's... terribly deeply. I mean, he, he seemed a little reticent to, you know, open up a whole lot about that. But I did not know about Jean Moreau. Like, yeah. that was interesting that, yes. you know, he actually had a love, a woman, uh, even though he was, you know, gay, maybe he was bi, who knows. But definitely he had a, a, a deep love for Jean Moreau and, and all his life. Um, they lived together for a while. She wanted to have his children, but she couldn't, sadly. So that was interesting fact. I didn't know about that. So this is, um, you know, it's a, a very little nice piece of documentary eye candy in many ways. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody who grew up during the 60s when he was really starting to make a name for himself, I'm sure will find it very nostalgic seeing all these brightly colored clothes with their geometric shapes and, you know, this, the models in their awkward and unusual poses and so forth. So, um, Stuff is beautiful. I yeah, mean, it, it really, really was. That, that red coat that launched his career, it was gorgeous, you know, and, and all the actresses that, in that, you know, people that he did in film and um, like people just loved him and they still love him. Yeah, the, it's, it's interesting. Some of the people who they have that they interviewed for like uh, Sharon Stone and mm -hmm. Dionne Warwick and um, uh, Naomi Campbell. I mean, it's um, a, a really good collection of people. They also have commentary from a number of other designers. Yeah. who talk about how he and, him, and uh, I guess a couple of them actually even worked with him at one point in some capacity yeah. or another. So, um, you know, they're grateful for help for him helping launch their careers as well. So, and he was not educated. He was uneducated oh. and he came to Paris want, wanting to be a designer. And, you know, who does he run into? <laughs> right smack into the, you know, uh, design world and and he gets he gets hired right away as and learns from the ground up and it's pretty amazing one of the other things i found interesting too is that compared to a lot of other designers uh they note in the film that he was also an expert tailor yes so this was somebody who not only understood the look but also understood the mechanics of yes. how to make fashion design work and that's something a lot of his other peers didn't do yeah, Naomi Campbell said, you know, if you can tailor, you'll always make money. Yes, exactly. And his nephew, you know, said he was futuristic. He's still futuristic because you look at those clothes today and you say, wow, they're still, you know, a couple of years from now, they could still just not, we're not there yet even. And, <laughs> and you like can they... translate that to fashion and to clothes <laughs> and, and, or, or into, you know, furniture or any, anything that's, you know, ultra modern. And you see, yeah, you know what? He was way, way, way ahead of his time and he's still ahead of his time. Yep, exactly. I mean, some of the stuff looks like it could come off of a Star Trek set. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, and... probably did. <laughs> I think he didn't do Star Trek <laughs> outfits. I don't know. Maybe. So, so this is a good one. It's, um, you know, it's not terribly deep, but you know, it's, it's a, it's a well put together film and uh, quite enjoyable. So I know you got a few others. Yeah. Well, the next one is um, uh, my pick for a movie to avoid. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, and that's um, Woody Allen's latest, uh, A Rainy Day in New York. And I, I almost kind of hate having to do that because I'm such a fan of his films, but um, this is a film that uh, had, he had a controversy in the fact that he made it when he was under contract with Amazon. And then uh, Amazon decided they didn't want to release it because of all the bad publicity that was going on in Woody Allen's life. So he had been fighting to try and get it into the market. Uh, I guess I believe he ended up suing Amazon and got the rights to the film back. So it was released in Europe earlier this year and it did fairly well over there. So they, they worked to get a deal set to get it released here in the U.S., um, you know, it's, it's not an awful film, but it's not a great film either. I mean, when you compare this to a lot of his previous works, it, it's kind of inconsequential in many ways. Um, it's a story that he's done kind of many times before where you see a romantic couple um, who probably shouldn't be together. And through a series of events, they end up meeting other people and coming to understand that they really need to be with somebody else. Okay, I mean, you know, how many times has he done that? I mean, he's, he, you know, he did it in Manhattan. He did yeah. it in Annie Hall. I mean, he did it in um, Hannah and Her Sisters. So many other times and so much better than here. Yeah, um, and you're not the first to say that. 
No, I mean, it's uh, some critics have been pretty merciless on it, saying it's just yeah. dreadful and awful. I wouldn't go that far, but it's certainly... I mean, you got a wonderful not, cast. Yeah, I mean, but it's certainly not at the par. Um, yeah, yeah. The, the supporting cast in particular is what really makes this film. The two leads, Timothy Chalamet and Al, and Al Fanning, uh, they really should have recast both of them. They're both kind of over the top. But his supporting players, um, Leo Schreiber, um, Jude Law. Law, Sherry Jones, Rebecca Hall, they're all terrific. Um, so they're, they're kind of unfortunately trapped in a bad film. It <laughs> doesn't really you know, allow them to get the recognition that they should be getting for their performances here. Yeah, so, people are really down on Woody a lot. Just the man himself, you know, yeah. the, in the past couple of years, really, I, you know, choices that he's made in his personal life. But, you know, I, I mean, you think of, um, uh, the people like Scarlett Johansson careers he's launched for, you know, like Scarlett's and, and, um, Diane Keaton and, um, just so many people, you know, really kind of, oh, their their luck or whatever you want to call it. Well, the to- number, the number of women that he's directed to either Oscar nominations or Oscar wins mm-hmm. is phenomenal. I mean, Kate Blanchett and, um, you know, uh, Diane Weist. And- yeah. You know, it's, I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. And uh, they've, they've all been terrific films. I've so, always really liked Woody Allen. Yeah. I feel kind of um, sad about that. It's, it's um, you know, it's kind of unfortunate to see that I think with age, he's kind of lost some of his step. Mm. And the, the snappiness that used to be there in the older films just isn't quite there to the same degree. Uh, this movie does have some laughs in it, but it could certainly have used quite a few more. <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, I mean, um, and it's, you know, it's not, a, it's not a terrible story, but it just doesn't have a very good script to support it. Yeah, yeah. It kind of feels like it was a first draft that he, you know, uh, ran out and made into a movie. And it could have gone through some tweaking, I think, to be better. So, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing that I guess, you know, eventually if it comes to cable or, you know, if it's in the, the, the low price, street, yeah. you might want to catch it on a rainy, it. on a rainy day or rainy <laughs> afternoon, you know, you're bored it, to tears and yeah, exactly. nothing being made on TV. Yeah. Okay. I'll watch but that. I, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that you should really rush out and see this. This is playing in theaters and I'm, I'm actually kind of surprised that in my local theater, it's been there for three weeks already. Oh, which, wow. Which I mean, at, the time that I saw it, I was one of three people in the theater. So okay, yeah. So <laughs> it's something. hanging on, but I'm I'm kind of surprised it's hung on as long as it has. So okay, where you want to go? Chicago? Okay, so next I'm I'm going to talk very briefly about some of the film festival movies that I've watched. Uh, so far, I've been to two festivals. Um, they've all been virtual, which has been great because I've been able to watch things okay. from home. I've been so how, how much is a ticket now for a virtual festival ticket? Uh, they've, you know, they've actually dropped the festival prices compared to what they did in the past. It used to be that the virtu- the in-theater festival tickets were like 15 a piece. This year they dropped them down to about 10. Okay. Um, and if you end up buying like a, a pass, like an all access pass or yeah. a, a, a number of uh, films, you know, in a package, it's a pretty good deal. Um, nice. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I purchased um, an all access pass to the Reeling Festival, which is the Chicago Gay and Lesbian Festival. And um, it was 150 bucks. I watched 18 movies, you know. So That's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and with the St. Louis Festival coming up in a couple of weeks, um, again, the, the, the the all access pass is 150 bucks. I'm signed up for 20 films. Okay. Yeah. So, wow. Yeah. So, I mean, it really, Can't beat that. yeah. I mean, you can really drop the price considerably. So, um, so from reeling, there was only really one film that I thought was particularly outstanding. And that's a movie called Cicada. And it was uh, reviewed in the, um, not the current movies with meaning pose, but the most recent one before that. It tells the story of a uh, interracial gay male couple uh, who have each survived various forms of trauma, but they haven't fully resolved their circumstances yet. So the film follows them as they are each working through their uh, respective traumas individually and as a couple. And uh, it's interesting to see that you have the combination of both pain and support through a situation like that. 
it's it's really very well done. Um, I'm I'm hoping that this will get a wider release at some point because it's excellent. Um, it's the kind of movie that not only discusses trauma from the standpoint of a gay couple, but it, I think any couple that is going through uh, circumstances like this can relate to it. So yeah, uh, I tried to get it. I couldn't get it. Um, I did want to watch it. Yeah, I have a feeling it it might get a release at some point. I really hope so. It's certainly worth it from my yeah. standpoint. Um, very well made um, from a, you know, a kind of an independent little production. Uh, it also features a really interesting uh, supporting performance by the actress Kobe Smulders. Oh, who yeah. used to be on the sitcom How I Met Your Mother. Yeah. Uh, she plays a therapist and she plays kind of a a kooky, crazy sort of therapist. And she's like the comic relief for the movie. In many ways, she reminded me of the character that Judd Hirsch played in the movie Ordinary People back in 1980. Yeah, um, yeah. You wouldn't you wouldn't expect the the comic relief to come from a therapist, but it does, and it's, it works really well. So, I guess so, so if you I, can I, find I, a way I, to see it. Go see it. Um, when we Brent started off this this little bit on on Sakata, um, he mentioned reading it and you can go to the good radio network website where he has movies with meaning and he reviews many movies that we haven't discussed here uh, but you can go on there and get some more reviews so that's that's the good radio network.com and just go to movies with meaning and you can find out all about these movies and more movies i just wanted to bring that up yeah and actually I, uh, all four of the other movies that we discussed previously um blackbird trial of chicago seven House of Cardona, kind of the piano. They are all either in the current or the most recent post on uh, movies. There you go. So, okay. so then in addition to the uh, Reeling Festival, I also just finished attending the Chicago Film Festival, which I did virtually also. And the first film that I saw and absolutely loved is a Greek film called Apples. And this is an interesting little meditation on the notion of memory and how selective our retention of it is. Uh, a man suddenly finds himself uh, suffering from amnesia and can't, not only can't remember anything about himself, but can't remember a lot of things about how to live a normal, everyday, basic life. Oh. So he's enrolled in a program through a hospital uh, in which the, uh, they teach him how to develop a new identity. And they have him do a lot of really crazy and kooky things that are sort of out there, but they're meant to be out there enough so that they will leave enough of an indelible mark that it will help to fuse into, um, you know, his memory. Some permanent memory. Going yeah. um, now, one of the things that's interesting is that he seems to have this really strong affinity for eating apples. <laughs> um, and somewhere along the line, he ends up finding out that if he wants to get his memory back, instead of eating apples, he should be eating oranges. Okay. So he starts eating oranges and suddenly little snippets of his memory start coming back. But the question becomes, are they things he wants to actually remember? So I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, that sounds that's, really that's, fun. I like yeah, that. that's, that's, the, that's the mystery that I'll leave you with on this, with this movie. But it's really very well written. It won the Silver Hugo Award for Best Screenplay at the Chicago Film Festival. I see it was at TIFF, too, so I might be able to get it here. Uh, it's um, uh, a film that uh, has a very quirky sense of humor, uh, like a lot of the other Greek directors who are out there right now, particularly like uh, Yorgos Lanthimos, who did the movies The Favorite and The Lobster. Yeah. Um, it's also reminiscent somewhat of the American director, Charlie Kaufman. Uh, you see dry wit in this movie that's very similar. The lobster to was a crazy movie. <laughs> <laughs> was in, uh, in, in Being There uh, with Peter Sellers from many years ago. Uh, and you've also got a, a mystery to be solved very much unlike what happened in the movie Memento by mm -hmm. Christopher Nolan. That was a good movie. A lot, of, a lot of very diverse influences all working into this. And it makes for a really wonderful movie. I mean, it, I was uh, I was captivated by this movie all the way throughout, and you know I really hope this gets a, a domestic release at some point because it's really worth it. Uh, my next one is a documentary called Kubrick by Kubrick, 
And this was made for, I believe it was a European arts and culture television network, sort of like the way A&E used to be here in the US. Mm -hmm. um, this examines the life of Kubrick and his films um, based on a series of interviews that were done by a writer named Michelle Simon. And that they were recorded on audio tape and never really heard very much. Um, so when you are seeing this film play out, you're hearing Kubrick's words um, come out from these interviews. And they talk about his philosophy of filmmaking. Uh, and interestingly enough, many of the principles that have come up in these interviews, which were done in the early 70s, actually apply to a lot of the movies he made after that as well. So you end up seeing um, his discussion of his theories about filmmaking uh, that applied not only to what he made before that point, but also to what would come afterward, even though those movies hadn't been made yet. It also features a number of interviews of people who worked with him, like Jack Nicholson, Tom Cruise, Nicole Kidman, um, Peter Sellers. You know, again, that list goes on and on as well. Yeah. And it really, it, the movie features a production design that is very reverent to the director and his work and very effectively ties in the points they're trying to make through this interview, these interviews, as well as uh, the elements that were made Kubrick's films famous at the same time. So I can't speak highly enough about this one. If you're a Kubrick fan, by all means, find a way to see it. You, you know, it's, it's really very, very well done. Awesome. All right. Okay. And then uh, another one that came out of the festival is a Mexican film Love called New Order. And um, this film is a kind of a difficult one to watch. It basically is set in a, uh, a more or less a present day version of Mexico City in which the city's haves and have nots mm. start going at it with each other in the streets. And uh, the reason why I say it is it's kind of a hard watch is the fact that it can get pretty graphic at times. I won't say it's gratuitous, it kind of virtues you know, it's like right on the edge of that, but it never goes quite over the edge. But it's still a number of the things that do take place in the film are rather shocking. Wow. Um, however, the reason why I think it's important is because it's a message that I think, in light of the current socio political climate, is something that we all need to take to heart. Um, I think a lot of times Americans seem to think that these things are unique to us, and they're not, they're happening all over the place. Uh, South America, Mexico, Europe, um, you know, and it, it's something that we had better wise up to it. We had better realize why it's happening, how it plays out. Well, uh, you look at those countries, you know, not so much Mexico today, but, you know, Mexico, South America, you've got dictator type people who, who split people. You've got Donald Trump who splits people. It's very divisive. And, and it's, it's very easy when the haves and haves nots, you know, look at one another, go, hey, why do you have it? And I don't. And because it's such a huge split that, you know, these things, it's easy for it to happen. And we're seeing it play out in America today. You're seeing it all over the place, um, you know, even in Canada, but not so much here as, as in the United States. But yeah, I mean, it, it should hit close to home. Actually, it's very much so. I mean, there were a number of films at the festival this year that dealt with themes kind of along these lines. Um, this was, I think, probably one of the better made ones that I saw. Um, and, you know, some critics have been a little uh, hard on this one saying, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's all so, so stereotypical, and blah, 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 blah. Of Mexico? Of yeah. Violence? And, and it, yeah, but at the same time, it's sort of like, well, if there's a kernel of truth in it, though, how can you ignore that? Well, you've got the cartel in Mexico and, and, you know, like it was last year, I think they murdered, you know, this Mormon family, a mother and her six kids. Like, right. that's not violent. What's violent? You know, yeah. like, what's the reason for this stuff? Exactly. Like, why do they do that? So, yeah, I mean, I love Mexico. It's one of my favorite places to, to go. But, you know, it's a reality check when, you, when you're there and there's soldiers on the street with machine guns in their hands. Like, yep. oh, okay. <laughs> you know? yep. and, the movie, and the movie points all that out. So. They need them. Yep. So, yeah. So, and finally, and I don't have, I didn't get a piece of artwork for this one. There's one other film that was, I saw it on the last night of the festival. It's a Dutch film called The Columnist. And this is um, <laughs> a wickedly dark, macabre 
comedy about a columnist for a popular Dutch periodical who ends up coming under attack unfairly and oh. with a lot of untrue statements um, in social media. Okay. And she ends up getting to a point where she reaches a breaking point and decides that she's going to start fighting back. Only she uses more than her words in the way she goes about it. So this is, like I say, it's a dark comedy. Um, it's it's very edgy. It's it's uh, the kind of thing that I I don't think it's going to get a release in the U.S. I think it may be a little too controversial, or a little too edgy for American audiences. But it's worth it. It's I mean, I, my partner and I watched it. And I mean, we've laughed from beginning to end at this. If you like comedy that's got an edge to it, by all means, go see this one. I, took, I forgot I muted myself, though they were banging on my, my thing. Um, thank you for that. That's great. And I need a comedy. I think we all need something a little lighthearted, and maybe you can find us that at the next festival. Who knows? But uh, Well, I've, I've signed up for 20 films. It's yeah. first, starting in a couple of weeks. So hopefully I'll have, um, you know, quite a bit there. Uh, just one, one word about the St. Louis Festival, if anybody's interested in attending. It's virtual, like the Chicago festivals we have been. And it's a lot of the items are gonna be available nationally. Um, not everyone, but quite a few of them. And also they have a number that are gonna be available for free. Okay. So um, you still need to sign up for those to see them. Yeah. Even though they are free, but you know, um, that's something that other festivals have not done to, so far. So you know, hey, yeah, you free for nothing these days, why not? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I wanted to mention that, you know, I've been watching some PBS because I don't know why, but I was so bored. I've seen so much stuff and I just had to start watching these shows and I am like blown away. I'm this, it's like reading a fantastic book, you know, so some of the shows that they have on there and they, and a lot of them were books, obviously older books, but um, Jamestown, Poldark, like they're just really good series and just beautifully done and, and costumes and everything. I love it. So if, if, you're bored and you wanted to watch something, you know, decent, good, well done productions, check out uh, PBS, Masterpiece Theater. Go for it. Yeah, go for it. All right, well, we will be back um, just before Christmas, I think, to make sure that you have some wonderful viewing <laughs> over the holidays with your family and uh, check some of these movies out. Yeah, I think you're going to you're going to see more of the award season movies get ready to be released. Uh, one that played at the fest at the Chicago Festival uh, called Nomadland um, is that got very very high marks. Uh, that one's going to be coming out, I believe, early in December. So, um, you know, there's um, really some good stuff I think in the wings. It's just that it's been a little delayed this year because of the whole movie yeah. theater situation, and because the the Oscar deadline was extended. So I believe that they have until the end of February to be able to okay. release and still qualify. So, All right. Well, Brent, thanks so much for, for putting these together for us. Don't forget to go to um, the Good Radio Network website to see and read all of the other movies that he's, um, that, you know, that he's covered. And we will say goodbye to you on Facebook Live, and we will see you next time. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Frankie.